Happy Saturday, everybody. Recently, we put out a call for episode suggestions on our Facebook page, and we specifically encourage topics from outside of North America and Europe because the vast majority of suggestions already on the list fall into those categories. We got a number of suggestions for episodes that we had already done, and so we are returning to one of them for today's classic. It's on the Catalpa rescue from Australia's Fremantle prison, so it actually connects all of these. <laughs> there's there's North America and there's Europe and also there's Australia. <laughs> and that episode originally came out on February 2nd, 2015. And in this episode, we say that this was the only successful jailbreak from Fremantle. Although this was repeated in a number of the sources that were used for the episode, that is not correct. Other escapes include Joseph Johns, a.k.a. Moondine Joe. His multiple prison escapes include breaking out of Fremantle in 1867 and remaining at large for two years. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today we're going to talk about a jailbreak, which sounds like an inherently interesting and exciting and dramatic subject. (laughs) This was the rescue of six Irish prisoners who had been convicted of crimes like treason and rebellion. And they were part of an organization called the Irish Republican Brotherhood, also known as the Fenians. They'd originally been sentenced to death because they were military men. While serving in the British Army, they had become part of a plot to turn the army against itself and instead fight for Irish independence. Now they were in prison for life. And a Quaker man, finding this imprisonment to be incredibly unjust, led a daring rescue party uh, to get them out of jail. So on on its own, (laughs) this already sounds pretty exciting. But these prisoners had been convicted in Britain, and the prison was in Western Australia. And the man who was leading this crew of men on a whaling ship to come and get them was from the United States. So it's it's truly an international affair. Right. It's an intercontinental uh, experience in, involving multiple hemispheres of the planet. Um, and, you know, to the person who recently said to us, please, for the love of God, no more shipwrecks. There are ships in the story, but fortunately, none of them wreck. So we've got nautical history and Irish history and Australian history and British history all tied together along with a nautical theme and a jailbreak. Hooray! There's also a listener request from Joseph. I should say that part, too. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I never would have known about it. <laughs> And this story takes place in the 1860s. We talked in our two-part episode on the Irish potato famine, what life was like in Ireland around this time. But here's a brief recap for those who have not maybe heard those episodes. The overwhelming majority of the Irish population was Catholic, and this continues to be true in the Republic of Ireland today. The whole of Ireland had become part of Britain in 1800 under the British Acts of Union, and at that point, Ireland had gained representation in Parliament. But Catholics specifically were not permitted to be members of Parliament. So consequently, while Ireland was part of Britain, for the most part, the Irish population, especially the Irish Catholic population, was basically disenfranchised. And on top of that, Ireland itself was stricken with poverty. Over generations, Irish families had lost their land to English landlords. Many Irish farmers were paying exorbitant rent on what had once been their own family's land. And there was a middleman between the farmer and the landlord who also took a cut of the profits along the way. This whole landlord, middleman, tenant system put tenants at a severe disadvantage, and many were barely subsisting. And then there was the Great Hunger, also known as the Great Famine or the Irish Potato Famine. And we've devoted two episodes to this in the past. And I'm going to recommend, if you're interested in this, please go listen to those because we are seriously, seriously glossing over it here. Potatoes were Ireland's staple crop. And so as crops failed, more than a million people died of disease and hunger. About two million people left Ireland in an effort to escape the famine. And by 1851, between 20 and 25 percent of the population of Ireland had either left or died. Which brings us to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or the Fenians. This was a secret society in Ireland, and it was devoted to achieving Irish independence from British rule by force. 
the Fenians were sure independence would come only through an armed rebellion. One of the leaders of this movement in Ireland was John Devoy, who was actively recruiting Irish soldiers who were serving in the British Army stationed in Ireland. It's estimated that he recruited 80,000 troops to this cause. But an informer tipped off the British government to what was going on. Devoy was arrested, convicted of treason, and sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. The British government arrested as many Fenians as they could find in 1865 and 1866, charging them with conspiracy and treason. These arrests really strained an already overcrowded British prison system. As we discussed in the Lady Juliana episode, the British prisons had become severely overcrowded due to a number of social and legal factors. And then after the American colonies declared their independence, Britain could no longer offload its prisoners to the Americas as it had been doing. So Britain had started using Australia for a penal colony instead. By this point, though, there was only one place left in Australia where Britain was sending new prisoners. And this was Swan River Colony on Australia's western coast, which housed Fremantle Prison. Fremantle was supposed to be impenetrable, but it wasn't really the building itself that earned it that reputation. Although the conditions at the prison were very severe and poor, it was the surrounding area that made it seem impossible to escape. It was located on an, in an expanse of desolate, dry landscape, and anyone who tried to escape would either have to go deeper into the outback or to the coast, where the waters were widely reported to be infested with sharks. As the arrests of Fenians continued, Britain started sending them to Fremantle Prison. And in October of 1867, the Hugomont, which was the last ship to carry prisoners from Britain to Australia, left Portland carrying 280 convicts, and of those, 62 of them were Fenians. And they arrived in Fremantle in January of 1868. Although some of the Fenian prisoners abo- aboard the Hugomont were civilians and would eventually be pardoned, 12 of them had been members of the military and had been sentenced for life. Seven of those 12 had actually originally been sentenced to death, but Queen Victoria had eventually commuted their sentences to lifetime transportation, along with the branding of the letter D for deserter on their chests. And one of these prisoners actually became a key player in planning the jailbreak that we're talking about today after he had escaped himself. But we can hop into that whole story after we have a brief word from a sponsor, if that's cool with Tracy. Sure thing. So to get back to the events in Australia, one of the Fenians who had been sent to Fremantle Prison was a man named John Boyle O'Reilly. But after arriving at Fremantle, he was later transferred to another prison in Bunbury, which was south of Fremantle. In 1869, he escaped from that second prison with the help of a Catholic priest. Then he was able to win the sympathies of Irish colonists in the area and board a whaler that was bound for America. Once he got to the United States, O'Reilly, who had been the assistant editor of the newspaper that the convicts had made for themselves on the way to Australia, became an editor of the Boston Pilot. I love that they made a newsletter for themselves. They did. And the whole thing was eventually released as like a bound book for people to read. On the one, I'm not sure if you can find it online, but probably you can. On the one hand, I'm like, wow, that takes so much like dedication. And on the other, I'm like, did they have anything else to do on the voyage? Maybe it was just a time killer. But I do not know. Uh, but not long after that, Devoy, the one who had been sentenced to hard labor for recruiting Irish soldiers, was exiled to America. He eventually went to work for the New York Herald, and he became involved in a secret society called the Clan Nguyen, which was sort of an offshoot of the Fenian Brotherhood. In 1874, one of the Fenian prisoners named James Wilson wrote a letter to John Devoy at the newspaper. This letter included the much-quoted passage, Remember, this is a voice from the tomb, for is this not a living tomb? In the tomb, it is only a man's body that is good for worms. But in this living tomb, the canker worm of care enters the very soul. Devoy started to feel increasingly guilty about the Fenians still in Fremantle. After all, he'd been the one recruiting them all. 
He hatched a plan in conjunction with O'Reilly and other members of his secret society to rescue the rest of the military uh, Fenians from Fremantle. And they would secure a ship, go to Australia, and get the men out. At first, O'Reilly's plan was to lease a ship, but eventually they decided to buy one instead. He sought donations, and one man mortgaged his house, and eventually they were able to buy the whaling ship Catalpa. The ship's captain was George S. Anthony, who was kind of an unlikely ally, especially considering how long and dangerous the mission was going to be. He had no connections to the Fenians or to the Clan de Guayo. He was he was not Irish or Catholic. He was actually a Quaker. And he took the helm in his own words because it was the right thing to do. People focus on this a lot. Like, Irish people and Catholic people were receiving so much discrimination at the time that it was really shocking that this person who had absolutely no ties to them whatsoever took this on. Anthony had to keep the real mission secret from the rest of the crew for two reasons. One was the risk of the British finding out what they were up to. The more people who knew, the greater it was that somebody was going to accidentally or deliberately spill the beans. The other was that they were going to have to operate as an ordinary whaling vessel along the way because the proceeds from their whaling work were supposed to offset the cost of the rescue mission. Captain Anthony and the Catalpa departed from New Bedford, Massachusetts in April of 1875, and they were to reach Fremantle in January. They had a bit of good luck along the way. By total coincidence, not long after the Catalpa rounded the Cape of Good Hope, it encountered another ship called the Ocean Beauty, which was captained by a man named Cozens, who had been the master of the Hugamont. Cozens still had the charts that he had used while carrying convicts to Fremantle, and he gave those charts to Captain Anthony. However, despite that one stroke of good fortune, most of their luck was actually pretty bad. Uh, Some of Anthony's navigation equipment turned out to be faulty. And then the whaling part of the voyage went terribly, meaning that they were not able to recoup the expenses of the mission with the proceeds from whaling that they had planned for. And the weather was often against them. And at one supply stop, six of the crew actually deserted. They wound up missing the mark for their arrival in Australia by almost four months. As all of this was going on, there was a whole other part of the plan happening in Australia while Captain Anthony and his crew were on the way. And we're going to talk about that part of it after a brief word from a sponsor. As Captain Anthony and his crew were on their way to Australia, two Fenian agents were orchestrating a whole other arm of this scheme. Thomas Desmond and John Breslin set sail for Australia at about the same time as Captain Anthony and the Catalpa left Massachusetts. The two men sailed from California, though, and they were supposed to arrive in Australia well ahead of the Catalpa. And Breslin actually gets most of the glory here. Uh, He basically orchestrated a long con in which he posed as a wealthy American investor so he could gain access to the prison and make contact with the Fenian prisoners. Working under the pseudonym James Collins, Breslin scouted out the prison. He met with officials under the guise of hiring prisoners as cheap labor. He also made friends with an ex-con who had access to the prison and could ferry messages back and forth. He got a sense of how things were run and which tasks the prisoners were assigned to because some of them gave them a legitimate reason to be outside of the prison walls. What he found was that the security in the prison itself was not actually all that uh, tight. The prison relied on this completely inhospitable landscape surrounding it to do most of the security work for them. Anthony's multi-month delay caused a number of problems on Breslin's side of things. The longer he ran this con, the more likely he was to be discovered. And the prison kept changing the work assignments of the prisoners to be rescued, which was upending his plans for getting them out. And Fenians in Australia started concocting their own escape plan. But Breslin found out about it, and he was able to convince them to just join his effort instead. And throughout, there was this worry that the Catalpa had been sunk along the way and was just not coming at all. The most alarming development in this whole multi-month con was the sudden arrival of two Irishmen who started asking strange questions about the prisoners. 
everyone who was involved in the Australia side of this plot was terrified that they were British spies, that somehow word had gotten out about what they were doing and that the British had seen, had sent someone to, to figure out what was happening. It turned out, though, that they had also gotten letters from Fenian prisoners asking for help, and they were there to provide that help. These two men wound up being tasked with cutting the telegraph wires leading out of Fremantle on the morning of the jailbreak. Finally, in April, Anthony and the Catalpa made it to Australia, and he and Breslin set the date for the jailbreak as Easter Monday, April 17th. It was traditional for many of the prison officials to go to Perth that day for a regatta, so everyone hoped that security would be even more lax than normal. And they sent a message to the prisoners that this would be their one and only shot. On the morning of Easter Monday, Thomas Dara, Thomas Hassett, Robert Cranston, Martin Hogan, Michael Harrington, and James Wilson slipped away from the prison. Two of them had actually been assigned work to do that day that was outside of the prison walls, and the other four had one way or another bluffed their way past the guards, who apparently never considered that they might have been escaping because that thought was just so foreign to them. The men who became known as the Fremantle Six actually left a seventh man named Jeffrey Roach behind because he had earlier tried to get a reduced sentence for himself in exchange for cooperating with the British which the remainder of his uh, Fenian cohorts did not approve of. And so the six men headed for the road, where Breslin and Desmond met them in carriages and raced off for Rockingham, 20 miles away, where Anthony was waiting with Catalpa's whaleboat. Basically, it was a little rowboat. Unfortunately, while he was waiting around with this rowboat, Anthony had drawn the attention of a local who became suspicious that something weird was going on. And when six prisoners and two other men appeared on the shore, this local man went to get help. At this point, the prison authorities knew that the jailbreak had happened and a search was in progress, even though the downed telegraph wires meant they hadn't been able to raise the alarm elsewhere. Once all nine of the men were in the whaleboat and they were rowing to meet the Catalpa, Breslin read this note, then sealed it in a waterproof package and threw it toward shore. To His Excellency, the British Governor of Western Australia, this is to certify that I have this day released from the clemency of Her Most Gracious Majesty Victoria, Queen of Great Britain, etc., etc., six Irishmen condemned to imprisonment for life by the enlightened and magnanimous government of Great Britain for having been guilty of the atrocious and unpardonable crimes known to the unenlightened portion portion of mankind as love of country, and hatred of tyranny. For the act of Irish assurance, my birth and my blood being my full sufficient warrant. Allow me to add that I take my leave now. I've only to say a few cells I've emptied, a cell in its way. I've the honor and pleasure to bid you good day. From all future acquaintance, excuse me, I pray. In the service of my country, John J. Breslin. And we do not know if this letter made it to the governor. The text that we actually have for reference is from an account that Breslin wrote about the escape. So, but after that, the whole thing once again almost fell apart. The men in the whaleboat could see a steamer, which was the Georgette, apparently searching for them in the water. And as they rowed toward the Catalpa, a storm blew in. This overcrowded whaleboat was in danger of sinking, and they had to bail, row, and try not to capsize all through the night. As the men in the whaleboat were trying to keep themselves alive, the Georgette found the Catalpa, but the first mate, left in charge while Anthony was away, would not allow them to board. They eventually ran low on fuel, and they had to return to shore. Not long after sunrise on Tuesday the 18th, So at this point, they've been out of the jail for about 24 hours. The men in the whaleboat spotted the Catalpa. But as they made their way toward the ship, the Georgette spotted them too. So they, in their little rowboat, had to race a steamer to the Catalpa, trying to get to the Catalpa before the Georgette could get to them. And they made it. But luck was still kind of playing against them. The wind stopped, and once the men were aboard, they couldn't go any further. They were becalmed, and the Georgette returned. And it had, in the meantime, acquired a cannon, and it fired a warning shot. 
the escaped prisoners armed themselves mostly with harpoons. And Captain Anthony, who ran up an American flag, called to the Georgette, that's the American flag. I am on the high seas. My flag protects me. If you fire on this ship, you fire on the American flag. The colonial police aboard the Georgette had been ordered not to cause an international incident. And so they waited for a while, essentially at a stalemate, with the Georgette trying to nudge the becalmed Catalpa back into Australian waters. It did not work, and finally the wind picked up, blowing the Catalpa out to sea. The Georgette followed for a while before finally heading back to Fremantle. There are all these accounts of when the wind picked up. It, like, swung the rigging of the Catalpa around, narrowly missing the Georgette. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a movie, but like the sinking of the S5, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Anthony and the escaped men arrived in New York on August 19th, four months after escaping from the prison. They were met with just a raucous celebration among New York's Irish community. The reception of this news in Britain was a lot less positive, though. Britain was livid and accused the United States of harboring terrorists. And this story fueled Irish nationalists and the movement for Irish independence. And that is a whole additional series of other stories culminating in the creation of the Irish Free State and later the Republic of Ireland. We have some detail about what happened to the rescuers after this was over. O'Reilly was a poet and a writer, and he died in 1890 at the age of 46. Desmond and Breslin became part of the Irish Republican Brotherhood in America, and Desmond eventually also became sheriff of San Francisco. John Devoy continued to be active in the Clan Naguil and active in the struggle for Irish independence from America. He did eventually get to return to Ireland toward the end of his life. The Catalpa returned to service as a whaling ship, and it was eventually used to carry coal. The rescue mission was Captain Anthony's last sea voyage, and he unfortunately died of pneumonia. Much less is known about the later fates of the Fremantle Six, except that, by all accounts, they were broken men after their time in Fremantle prison. The few Fenians left in Fremantle after the jailbreak later wound up being pardoned. This was the only successful prison break from Fremantle. Uh, Remember, John Boyle O'Reilly's escape was from a different prison. And it became a highly celebrated event. One ballad became so popular and so controversial that it was officially banned in Western Australia. And as of 2013, it still was. The ballad starts out, a noble whale shipping commander called the Catalpa, they say, came out to Western Australia and took six poor Fenians away. So come all you screw warders and jailers, remember Perth Regatta Day. Take care of the rest of your Fenians or Yankees will steal them away. And Fremantle Prison closed on November 8th of 1991. I'm glad Joseph asked for this story. Me too. Um, Like, there are lots of sources about this. There's a whole book about it. There is a Secrets of the Dead episode on PBS called The Irish Escape. That's all about it. So there are lots of resources about it. But still, I had not really heard about it before. And apparently, even though it sparked a whole surge of Irish nationalism at the time, By the time uh, the Republic of Ireland actually gained its independence from Britain, this part of the story had been kind of maybe not forgotten, but it wasn't so much in the limelight anymore. It was one of those stories that was then rediscovered again a little more recently. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 